What I want to talk about now is what this elasticity measure is really telling us about the shape of the demand curve. So up to this point, um, you've learned how to calculate the elasticity and you've learned how to interpret the number that you've got. That was the uh, previous video. So what we want to do now is think about what this means graphically. What the elasticity is telling us really is something about the steepness of the demand curve. And I'll give you a picture that will help you understand that here in a second. But let's start with a couple of extreme demand curves. I want to give you some pictures of special cases of demand curves. Let's think about, suppose your demand, suppose there was a good for which your demand, the number of units you wanted to buy didn't change if price changed. So maybe a kind of an extreme example of this is, let's suppose you have a medical condition and that medical condition requires you to take one pill per day um, to keep your heart running. And if you don't take that pill, then your heart stops and you die. And if you take two pills, that doesn't help you. You just need one pill per day. And I know that's an extreme example, but let's think about what your demand curve would look like in that case. Your demand curve there is going to be perfectly vertical. What that means is, it doesn't matter if the price of that pill, it's going to be vertical at one pill per day. It doesn't matter if the price of that pill is really low or the price of that pill is high. You need, you want one pill per day. The price of that pill could get so high that you can't afford to buy it. And that's a whole different issue. But if we think about how much you want to buy at reasonable prices, it's not going to be affected by the price. In other words, you're not going to respond at all to a change in price. And we would say that your demand is perfectly inelastic. So here, demand is perfectly inelastic. You don't respond at all when the price changes. If we were to calculate your price elasticity of demand, it would be zero. A 1% change in price causes a 0% change in your quantity demand. So that's the first kind of extreme demand curve. Let me draw you another one. And we'll talk about this type of demand curve a lot later on in the class when we start thinking about perfect competition. But let's suppose that if the price, there's a good for which, if the price goes up any at all, you switch to a, a substitute good. In that case, the demand curve would be perfectly horizontal. And if the price was anywhere above this point, you would buy none of the good. Okay? This would be what your demand curve would look like if there was a perfect substitute available. So if two goods were perfect substitutes and you're consuming this one and then its price goes up, you would switch to consuming this one because it's a perfect substitute. So here, we would say that your demand is perfectly elastic. Perfectly elastic. If you calculated the price elasticity of demand, it would be infinite. Price elasticity of demand would be infinite. And you'd need to use some limit mathematics to calculate that. We're not going to calculate that. But this gives you an idea of kind of the two extreme situations for a demand curve. It's either going to be perfectly up and down, perfectly inelastic, perfectly, el perfectly inelastic, perfectly elastic, or something in between there. Most of the time it's going to be in between. These are extreme cases. So what we see is that elasticity tells us something about the steepness of the demand curve. Let me give you another picture most demand curves that we're going to be thinking about in this class are not going to be perfectly inelastic or perfectly elastic. They're going to be downward sloping. But what we're seeing is that the flatter the demand curve, the more elastic demand is. Here you respond infinitely much. Here you don't respond at all. The more steep the demand curve is, the more inelastic demand is. So let's think about a couple of demand curves. Let, let's draw a demand curve that's relatively steep here. Let's call this uh, D1. And let's pick a price. Let's suppose we have a price like P1. 
and we look at the quantity demanded at that price, Q1. So down here's Q, up here's price, just like normal. So at that price of P1, we can look at the quantity that people want to buy. If we were to decrease price, we see that people will want to buy more. But what I want to do is I want to draw another demand curve through that point. We're going to draw a demand curve through that point, call it D2. So demand curve D1 is steeper than demand curve D2. We know that that means demand curve D1 is more inelastic than D2. Another way to say that is D2 is more elastic than D1. Let's decrease price now to P2. So we're going to decrease price and compare the response with each of these demand curves. With demand curve D1, we see that when we decrease price from P1 to P2, consumers buy more of the good, but not a lot more. And the reason is, is because that demand curve is relatively steep. Demand is relatively inelastic. If we look at demand curve D2, if we start at the same point, the same price, and we decrease price by the same amount, with demand to curve D2, we get a much bigger response. Consumers respond a lot more. When price falls, quantity demanded rises by a lot more with demand curve D2 than it did with demand curve D1. So with demand curve D2, we would get the result that consumers respond a lot to a change in price compared to D1. This demand curve is more elastic. So elasticity is a measure of the steepness of the demand curve. What that means is we've got to think now when we draw a demand curve, and here we'll, we'll learn that this is true with a supply curve also. We need to think about how steep we make that demand curve and how steep we make that supply curve. Because the steepness that we give it is going to tell us something about the elasticity. So if we were going to draw the demand curve for gasoline, we know people don't respond very much to the, a change in the price of gasoline. So D1 would be a much better demand curve for gasoline than D2 would be. Okay, so we have to think about that, and it depends on the type of good that we're considering. You might ask, well, why don't we just use the slope? I can remember when I first learned this. That's the first thing that popped into my mind. If what we're interested in is a measure of the steepness of a demand curve, why don't we just use the slope? Because we already know the slope. It's easy to calculate. It's just the rise over the run. The problem with using the slope is that it has units of measure. So if we were looking at the slope of the demand curve, and let's say this was the demand curve for, for apples, then it would be price up here and the quantity of apples down here. And so we could see if we decrease price by $2, how many more apples does the consumer want to buy? And so it would be dollars per apple. But then that would create a problem if we wanted to compare that to the demand curve for gasoline, because with the demand curve for gasoline, it would be dollars per gallon of gas. And so we've got apples and gallons of gas, and we've got a unit of measure problem there. If we will instead think about these changes in percentage terms, the percent change in price and the percent change in quantity, then that eliminates our units of measure. And we can compare the elasticity of the demand curve for apples with the elasticity of the demand curve for gasoline. And so if we were just to use the slope, we wouldn't be able to compare different demand curves. But by using the uh, elasticity, we are able to do that. So that's why we don't use the slope. Let's talk about why elasticity measures. At this point, you may be thinking, well, this just seems like a, a way to make um, a principles of a microeconomics class more ca complicated. Why do we need to come up with some mathematical, new mathematical way of measuring the steepness of these things? And the answer is that the elasticity of the demand curve is going to be very important in terms of understanding how um, firms are helped or hurt by changes that take place in a, in a uh, market. So let's start by looking at the relationship between the revenue that a firm earns, total revenue, and the elasticity of the demand for what it's selling. 
let's start by thinking about where total revenue shows up. If I were to draw a demand curve here, so here's a demand curve. Let's think about the price of the good. Let's suppose the price of the good is right there. And let's think about the, the quantity at that price. If we go over here to the demand curve, there would be the quantity at that price. Let's call it P1Q1. I'm leaving off a couple of things here, actually one important thing. For that to be the price in this market, my supply curve would be going right through that point, but I want to leave that off. I, I don't want this to be any more complicated than it has to be. The total revenue that a firm earns is going to be equal to the price of the good multiplied by the quantity of the good. So if you're selling 100 units and you're charging $2 per unit, you're bringing in revenue of $200. So this vertical distance right here is P and this horizontal distance right there is Q. Total revenue is equal to price times quantity. So what this is telling us is this total revenue can be found by taking this vertical distance P and multiplying it by this horizontal distance Q. If you take a vertical distance and multiply it by a horizontal distance, you're getting an area. And this is telling us that the area of this rectangle right here is equal to total revenue. That area tells us the revenue that firms in this market are earning. And so what we want to do is we want to think about how this area, how total revenue changes depending upon the steepness of the demand curve that the firm, all the firms are facing in this particular market. So I need to clear this off and then we'll draw a picture here that compares two different demand curves and we'll see it's very easy to understand why the steepness of this demand curve matters when we're thinking about revenue. Let's do something similar to the picture that we had up here just a little bit ago. Let's consider two different demand curves. We'll separate this out so that we can get a better idea of what's happening in these two different markets. So let's um, think about a demand curve over in this picture that's relatively steep. Okay, so here's a demand curve. I want to start with a particular price. Let's suppose we start with a price equal to $2. And let's go over to this demand curve and uh, think about a quantity. Let's suppose at that, that price, the quantity demanded in this market is 50. So again, I'm going to leave off my supply curve right there, but the supply curve would be going through, let's call that point A. Now, what I want to do in my right-hand picture is I want to start at the same place in that market but I'm going to make my demand curve relatively elastic. I'm going to make it flatter. So what I want to do over here is use the same price of 2, go over about the same distance, and have a quantity of 50. And I'm going to make my demand curve in that picture relatively flat through that point. Not all the way flat, obviously, but relatively flat, relative to this one. And let's also call that point A. Let's think about, this is going to be two different markets. This, in this market, demand for this good is relatively inelastic. In this market, demand for the good is relatively elastic. Okay. But let's think about total revenue at A. Total revenue at A. So total revenue at A is going to be the price times the quantity. It's going to be $100. If we do in this market total revenue at A, it's going to be the same. It's going to be price times quantity, which is $100. So firms in each of these markets are going to be earning the same amount of revenue. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to change the price. Let's suppose that um, price doubles. Let's make my price go up to 4. So right up here is 4. 
Now, if I go over at that price to that demand curve on the right hand side, because it's relatively flat, I hit it really quickly. Right there's the quantity demanded at that price. Let's suppose it's 10 units. And let's call that point B. Let's do the same thing over in this market. We double the price up here to four. Because this demand curve is relatively steep, when we go over and we hit the demand curve, what we see is that we hit it right there. Let's suppose that's 40. We'll call that point B. So the same thing has happened in each of these markets. We started at the same place and we raised price by the same amount and we get two completely different outcomes in terms of revenue. So let's calculate total revenue at B. Over here, total revenue at B is 4 times 40. That's $160. If we think about what happens over here, total revenue at B is 4 times 10. That's $40. That doubling of price helps firms over here, but hurts firms right there. Now let's think about what that means. We have to wrap our head around that because if I am in a face-to-face -face class and I ask, before I do this, if I ask my students, if you're running a firm, what do you hope that the market does to the price that you're selling your good for? Almost all of my students will say, okay, if I'm running a firm, sellers like high prices, so I should hope that the market drives the price up because then I'm going to make more dollars per unit. And so I would want the market to drive the price up. Well, what we're seeing right here is that's not always true. That's not always true at all. It depends on the type of demand curve that you're facing. It depends on what you're selling and the consumer's price elasticity of demand for that product, which you have no control over. You don't control consumer's price elasticity of demand. If you're in this type of market, if you're selling a good for which there are close substitutes, and the market drives your price up, then that's going to end up hurting you. Consumers are going to substitute away from your good towards other goods, and your revenue is actually going to go down. On the other hand, if you're selling a good for which there are not close substitutes, then if the market drives the price up, that's going to help you because consumers are going to buy less but not very much less. So notice here that elasticity helps us understand why in some cases firms are going to be made better off by price going up and in other cases firms are going to be made better off by price going down. There are firms if you think about this, firms in this type of market, suppose price started at four, then they would start earning $40 of revenue. If the market drove their price down, if the supply curve increased and it drove their price down by half, they're going to be better off. They're going to make more revenue. And hopefully you understand what's going on here. There are two things changing. Right? If price goes up, that's good for you if you're a seller. You're going to sell every unit for more dollars. The problem is when price goes up, consumers are going to want to buy less. So there's a good effect and there's a bad effect. Price goes up, but quantity goes down. And whether or not you're better off at the end of that process depends, whether, depends on whether or not price went up in percentage terms by more or less than quantity went down in percentage terms. On the other hand, if the market drives your price down, that by itself is bad for you. You're going to have to sell your good for fewer dollars than before. But there's a silver lining, and the silver lining is that consumers are going to want to buy more of the good because price went down. So you have this bad effect, price going down, but you have this good effect. You're going to sell more units, and it depends on which effect is bigger. Is price going to go down in percentage terms by more or less than quantity is going to go up? And of course, the measure that we've got, elasticity, tells us whether or not the percent change in quantity is bigger than or less than the percent change in price. So hopefully that helps you understand why
Some firms are going to want their price to go be driven down by the market and some firms would want their price to be driven up by the market. Here's the general rule. When demand is inelastic, when demand is inelastic, price and total revenue move in the same direction. Price and total revenue move in the same direction. In other words, if price goes up, total revenue goes up. That's this example. But if price goes down, total revenue goes down. If we start here at point B, total revenue would go from 160 down to 100. So when demand is inelastic, price and total revenue move in the same direction. When demand is elastic, price and total revenue move in opposite directions. That's the example on the right. In this example, when price went up, total revenue went down. If price were to go down, total revenue would go up. So in order to, order to understand how a change in the market, which we're talking about changes in supply here, how that impacts the firm, we need to know something about the steepness of the demand curve that the firm faces. Let's talk about another way that we can think about the terminology elastic and inelastic because it turns out that the elasticity of demand with a linear demand curve, the elasticity of demand changes along that linear demand curve. If I were to draw a demand curve where I've got price and quantity, so here's a demand curve. I've extended it from my vertical axis down to my horizontal axis. There's a demand curve D. It turns out that right here, if, if we were to look at the uh, price elasticity of demand right there in the middle of that demand curve, a couple of prices right there and infinitesimally close to each other and a couple of quantities, if we calculated price elasticity of demand right there, it would turn out to be equal to one, negative one. Demand would be unit elastic. If we were to calculate the uh, price elasticity of demand using two prices and quantities up here on this end of the demand curve, if you calculated that, you would get a price elasticity of demand greater than one in absolute value, and we would conclude that price elasticity of demand, let's say price elasticity of demand greater than one, demand is elastic up here. If you were to calculate the price elasticity of demand down here, you would get a price elasticity of demand less than one. We would say that demand is inelastic. What that means is that it depends on the portion of the demand curve that we're in as to whether or not demand is elastic or inelastic. Remember, the elasticity is not the same as the slope. If it was the slope, then the elasticity would never change because the slope of a line is the same here and there and here and there. But we're not using the slope. We're using the percent change in price and the percent change in quantity. And so the elasticity of demand varies along a linear demand curve. So I could use the term elastic and inelastic to refer to two different demand curves. This demand curve is more elastic than this demand curve, or I could use the term elastic and inelastic to describe one end of a demand curve, a linear demand curve, or the other end of a linear demand curve. When I talk about elastic or inelastic, when I use those terms from now on, I'm going to be using them to compare the steepness of two demand curves. Okay? If I ever need to in the future talk about one end of the demand curve or the other, then I'll make sure that I tell you that I'm, I'm talking about that. So if I say, think about demand being elastic, you need to envision in your mind a relatively flat demand curve, okay? But keep in mind that elasticity does change. What we want to do now is think about some other demand elasticities. So uh, let's clear this off and then we'll take a look at that. There are a couple of other demand elasticities that we need to calculate. The nice thing about them is you calculate them exactly the same 
as what we did with price elasticity of demand. It's just going to be the ratio of 2% changes. So if we think about the first one that we're going to talk about, it's going to be what we call cross price elasticity of demand. Cross price elasticity of demand. I'm going to abbreviate it that way. I'm going to denote it CPED, cross price elasticity of demand. Cross price elasticity of demand is going to tell us something about how your demand for one good changes when the price of another good changes. So we could think about how your demand for hot dogs changes when the price of buns changes. Or maybe how the, um, your demand for Pepsi changes when the price of Coke changes. So we're going to be thinking about um, the relationship between um, your demand for one good and a related price. Remember, the, one of the determinants of demand is the price of related goods. So that's what our cross price elasticity of demand has to do with. And it's easy to calculate. It's just the percent change in quantity of good one. I'm going to put here good one, just a little arrow to indicate that this is going to be the percent change in the quantity of one of the goods divided by the percent change in the price of good two, a related good. So you can see that the formula looks the same as what we did for price elasticity of demand, but there we were looking at the quantity demanded of that good and the price of that good. Now we're looking at the quantity demanded of one good and the price of a related good. Okay? But you calculate these percent changes exactly the same as what you did with um, the price elasticity of demand. So I could tell you that suppose when the price of um, hot dog buns is this amount, people buy this number of hot dogs. And when the price of buns changes to this amount, the number of hot dogs purchased changes to that amount. So I give you two prices and two quantities, you calculate the price elasticity of demand exactly the same as what we did with, or the cross price elasticity of demand, exactly the same as what we did with the price elasticity of demand. The interpretation is a little bit different. Let's look at that. So remember that two goods could be substitutes for each other or they could be complements for each other. If two goods are not related, then the cross price elasticity of demand would be zero. But if they are related, then they're either going to be substitutes or complements. Let's start with substitutes. So with substitutes, when we have to, anytime we're thinking about the cross price elasticity of demand, we have to pay attention to the sign. With substitutes, when you calculate the cross price elasticity of demand, it's going to end up being a positive number. With complements, it's going to end up being a negative number. Let's think about why that's going to be true. So for thinking about substitutes, let's think about uh, Coke and Pepsi. An increase in the price of Pepsi, so this is going to be positive, an increase in the price of Pepsi would cause people to buy less Pepsi and more Coke. So an increase in the price of Pepsi would increase the demand for Coke. A positive over a positive is a positive, so for substitutes, your cross price elasticity of demand would be positive. We could think about a decrease in price. Suppose we think about a decrease in the price of Pepsi. So suppose the price of Pepsi goes down, that's a negative. If the price of Pepsi goes down, people are going to want to buy more Pepsi, quantity demanded goes up, and because they're buying more Pepsi, they're going to buy less Coke, so the quantity of Coke that people buy is going to go down. You're going to have a negative over a negative, which together is a positive. So anytime you've got substitutes, your cross price elasticity of demand is going to be a positive number. If we're thinking about complements, it's going to be a negative number. Let's do use this ratio to figure out complements. Let's think about hot dogs and hot dog buns. Let's suppose you have an increase in the price of buns. You have an increase in the price of buns, people will want to buy less buns, and because they're buying less buns, they're going to want to buy less hot dogs. So you're going to have an increase in the price of buns will lead to a decrease in demand for hot dogs. 
you're going to have a negative over a positive, which is a negative. So for complements, it's going to be negative. Or we could think about a decrease in the price of hot dog buns. If the price of hot dog buns goes down, people are going to want to buy more buns. And because they're buying more buns, they're going to want to buy more hot dogs. So this one would be positive. You're going to have a positive over a negative. The ratio then would be negative. So you can see that with complements, the cross price elasticity of demand is a negative number. So if I were to ask you, say, on a test or a homework, if I gave you the cross price elasticity of demand, I didn't tell you whether it was complements or substitutes. If I give you this, like I say that suppose cross price elasticity of demand is equal to negative three-fourths, then you would be able to say, okay, well, it's a negative number. That means these two goods are complements. And a 1% increase in the price of one good causes a 3 fourths percent decrease in demand for the other good. Okay. So you interpret it the same. It's just the sign that matters here. Not whether or not it's bigger than or less than 1. We don't, it, it, right now we're not going to worry about that. So that's cross price elasticity of demand. There's also income elasticity of demand. Income elasticity of demand. Remember one of the determinants of demand is your income. Your demand for goods and services will change if your income changes. Your income elasticity of demand, I'm going to abbreviate this way, income elasticity of demand, and it's easy to calculate. It's just the percent change in quantity divided by the percent change in your income. Remember that your demand for a good we can think about the good being either a normal good or an inferior good. Let's start with a normal good. For normal goods, your income elasticity of demand, if income goes up, then your demand is going to go up. If income goes down, your demand for that good will go down. So for a normal good, your income elasticity of demand is going to be greater than zero. It's going to be positive. And for an inferior good, it's going to be negative. Inferior goods, income elasticity of demand is negative. Let's just think about how that works. Let's start with a normal good. A normal good for which if we have, is a good for which if we have an increase in your income, that's going to cause you to want to buy more of it. So your demand would go up. A positive over a positive is a positive. Or a normal good is a good for which a decrease in your income will cause you to buy less of the good. A negative over a negative is a positive. So for normal goods, the income elasticity of demand is a positive number. An inferior good is a good for which when your income goes up, you buy less of it. Your demand goes down. A negative over a positive is a negative number. So for an inferior good, your income elasticity of demand is negative. Or for an inferior good, if your income goes down, you buy more of the good. So we've got a positive over a negative, and again, that ratio would be negative. So for inferior goods, your income elasticity of demand is negative. So for an inferior, or excuse me, for an income elasticity of demand problem, I would say suppose when Bill's income is $100 per week, he buys this many pizzas. And when his income goes up to $200 a week, he buys this many pizzas. And so you would have two quantities, you calculate the percent change. Two income levels, you calculate the percent change. Keep track of if one's going up or one's going down. Keep track of the sign. But calculation of the income elasticity of demand is not hard at all, as long as you kind of think your way through it. Let's talk now about the price elasticity of supply. So uh, price elasticity of demand tells us about the steepness of the demand curve. Price elasticity of supply tells us about the steepness of the supply curve. So we're going to think about price elasticity of supply. Price elasticity of supply. I'm going to abbreviate it, P-E-S. And as you can imagine, 
it's very easy to calculate. Price elasticity of supply is just the percent change in quantity supplied divided by the percent change in price. You calculate your percent changes using the midpoint method. It's not hard. We use the exact same terminology. So the price elasticity of supply tells us how much sellers respond to a change in price. So if the price goes up, remember sellers like high prices. If the price goes up, do sellers sell a lot more or a little bit more? If they sell a lot more, we would say that supply is elastic. If they sell just a little bit more, we would say supply is inelastic. And, and if we wanted to understand what determines how elastic supply is, the elasticity of supply really depends upon the technology that's used to produce the good. So if we think about my elasticity of supply for teaching, if uh, the university came to me and said, hey, we've got uh, uh, some money we'd like to pay you to teach another class, I'm able to do that as long as I've got the time to do it. I can, I can teach another class if, if they wanted me to. On the other hand, suppose I was a seller of lakeside homes. And let's suppose yesterday I just sold my last lakeside home. And then today, all of a sudden, the price of lakeside homes skyrockets. And I think to myself, boy, I wish I had another one to sell today. It's going to require some time for me to build another, have a, another lakeside home built. So I can start building them, but it's going to be six months or a year before I can have them built and ready to sell. So it really kind of depends upon the production technology. Um, we can think about the time horizon. So supply tends to be more elastic over longer time horizons, which really is kind of the story I just told you with Lakeside Homes. So it depends a lot on, on kind of the technology. Let's think about some special cases. And we can think about two different extreme cases of supply curves. If we thought about a good for which the amount of it was fixed, then if we thought about, we could think about some antique guitar, um, the number of uh, this particular guitar that was made by the National Guitar Company in 1929. Well, there's going to be a certain amount of those. And if we thought about what the supply curve looked like for something that was available in fixed supply, this is a supply curve now, that supply curve would be vertical, we would say that supply is perfectly inelastic. And if we were thinking about a supply curve that is horizontal, oops, that should be quantity down here, I'm getting confused. Our supply curve could be horizontal. We would say that supply is perfectly elastic. Okay, so here the quantity doesn't respond to a change in price. It doesn't matter whether those guitars sell for a little bit or a lot. There's a certain number of them. Here we would say that supply is perfectly elastic. We'll talk about an example of this later on when we get to uh, where we're discussing perfect competition and how those types of markets work. If we think about interpretation, interpretation of price elasticity of supply is exactly like price elasticity of demand. Remember that quantity supplied and price move in the same direction. So our price elasticity of supply is always a positive number. We just don't even think about the sign because it's always positive. But if price elasticity of supply, if you calculate it, and it's greater than one, we would say that, price elast that supply is elastic. Supply is elastic. If you calculate the price elasticity of supply, and it's less than one, we would say that supply is inelastic. And if we calculate, calculate the price elasticity of supply and it's exactly equal to one, we would say that supply is unit elastic, just exactly like what we did with price elasticity of demand. So interpretation of price elasticity of supply is exactly the same as interpretation of price elasticity of demand. It's just that we're talking about the steepness of a supply curve. So if we were to think about a, a supply curve 
typically we're not going to be thinking about these extremes. We're going to be thinking about maybe a very elastic supply curve where it's, it's very relatively flat, or we could think about a supply curve that's relatively steep. We would say that this supply curve is more inelastic than this supply curve. Or the other way to say that is this supply curve is more elastic than this supply curve. So the elasticity of supply is just a measure of the steepness of the supply curve. What we want to do is clear this off and then we'll finish up by thinking about an example here that hopefully will tie together all of what we've just done right here. Let's think about how to use this concept of elasticity to understand something that happens in a market. So let's think about kind of a, a real world example of when elasticity, understanding elasticity might help you have a better understanding of something that you see out there in the world. Um, one of kind of the, the classic examples of how a misunderstanding of elasticity or not knowing what elasticity is might lead you to a distorted view of the world is what happens when we have a technology improvement that affects, say, the farming industry. And this is something that, that I witnessed firsthand. I went to graduate school up in, in Iowa at Iowa State University, and I had come from the Ozarks down in southern Missouri, and down there, uh, what it meant to be a farmer was that you had dairy cattle or you grew hay on your land. Um, there, down in the Ozarks, there's not a lot of row crops, but when you get up into North Missouri and more, up into Iowa, it's soybeans and corn and things like that. And so, um, and, and farming is big news up there because that's a, a very important industry. And so, um, when I moved up there, I started hearing more about farming, and it wasn't very long before um, there was some, uh, a news story that had come out and um, there was a new corn hybrid that had been developed and, and this new corn hybrid was, I think, I don't remember exactly what um, it was about the, the new strain of corn, but it, it was something that it was either more drought tolerant or it was resistant to some pest. But what it was going to do was to allow farmers to grow more corn per acre of land that they had in production. And it turned out that farmers opposed this. And um, there were a lot of people that were not farmers that kind of looked at this and said, boy, you know, this just doesn't make sense to have farmers oppose something that's going to be allow them to produce more. And so there were a lot of people that kind of laughed at the, the reaction that farmers had to this technology improvement. So let's think about what would happen if we had a technology improvement that allows farmers to grow more corn per acre. Let's think about this in terms of elasticity and in ter terms of the revenue that, that uh, farmers are going to earn. So if we think about drawing this picture now, we're, let's draw a picture of the market for corn. What we need to do, kind of the whole point of this chapter, is to make you realize that now you can't just draw any demand curve and supply curve that you want up here. It's going to be important for you to think about the steepness of the demand curve and, and possibly the steepness of the supply curve. So let's start by thinking about um, the steepness of the demand curve for corn. Turns out in this case that a technology improvement is going to shift the supply curve. So we're not going to have to worry too much at all about the steepness of the supply curve, but the steepness of the demand curve is important. So let's think about the market for corn. Okay, so this is the corn market. And let's think about whether or not demand for corn is elastic or inelastic. So the way to think about this, you can think about how you would respond to a change in the price of corn. So suppose that you want to, uh, I don't know, you want to grill out tonight and you're going to throw some corn on the grill. And so you go out to the grocery store and you're going to get some corn. You probably don't pay very much attention at all to a pri the price of corn. Most people, if you want to buy corn, it's such a small share of your budget that you just go out and you buy it. You don't know if a, a ear of corn costs 20 cents or a dollar. It's, it's not really important to you. So if we think about the demand for corn, it's going to be relatively inelastic. It's going to be pretty steep. When the price of corn goes out, goes down, you don't run out and stock up on corn. Okay. 
Now let's put a supply curve up here. Let's suppose that we have a supply curve that looks like that, S1. Let's label this initial intersection point A and let's think about a price and a quantity. Let's suppose the price up here is maybe three dollars per bushel of corn. It doesn't matter if that's really in the neighborhood of what a bushel of corn costs. We're, we're not really worrying too much about that. And let's suppose our quantity down here is, is 100. If this is the market for corn, that could be maybe millions of bushels. We, we don't really worry about that right now. So let's think about total revenue that farmers are going to earn at point A. Total revenue at A. Our total revenue at point A is going to be 3 times 100. It's going to be 300. If this was millions of bushels, that would be $300 million. Okay. So now let's think about what happens when this new corn hybrid is developed. It's going to increase. You know that technology is a determinant of supply. And if we have a technology improvement, it's going to shift that supply curve to the right. It's going to allow farmers to grow more corn. So let's shift it to say S2. We have an increase in technology. That's uh, supply curve S2. We get a new equilibrium right here at point B. We see that that increase in supply, not surprisingly, is going to drive price down. Let's suppose it drives it down to two dollars per bushel. It's going to drive quantity up but because that demand curve is relatively steep, it's not going to drive quantity up by very much. Let's suppose it goes up to 110. And if we think about total revenue at point B, so total revenue at B is equal to 2 times 110, that's going to be 220. What we see is that this increase in supply brought about by this technology improvement is going to cause the revenue of farmers to go down. So looking back on that situation, those people who were laughing at farmers and saying, gosh, these farmers don't even know, can't even see this technology improvement as something that's going to benefit them. Well, in terms of how many dollars are going to come in in terms of revenue, it's going to hurt them. The farmers knew exactly what was going on. It was the people that weren't farmers that misunderstood why farmers were opposing this. So it's important to think about the steepness of the demand curve. In this case, because our supply curve was shifting, we didn't need to worry about whether or not it was relatively flat or relatively steep because it was going to move us to a new point on the demand curve. It's only the steepness of the demand curve that matters in this particular situation. Okay. So that should give you an idea of why it's important to understand something about elasticity when we start thinking about changes that happen in a market. Let's finish up by just kind of some briefly summarizing the elasticities that we've thought about. We started with price elasticity of demand and there we're thinking about the price of the good and the quantity demanded of the good and the way you interpret that is whether or not it's greater than, equal to, or less than one. Right? That tells you if demand is elastic or inelastic or unit elastic. Then we talked about the cross price elasticity of demand. The sign of that one is important. The sign of this one we know is always negative, so we don't worry about the sign. We think about this one in terms of whether or not it's greater than, equal to, or less than zero. Is it positive or negative? That tells us whether or not the two goods are complements or substitutes. Then we talked about the income elasticity of demand, and that one we also interpreted in terms of whether or not it was greater than, equal to, or less than zero. The sign of that one matters. It tells us whether or not the good is a normal good or an inferior good. And then we finished up by thinking about the price elasticity of supply. And we interpret that the same as what we did with the price elasticity of demand, whether or not it's greater than, equal to, or less than one. All of them are just a ratio of 2% changes and all of your percent changes are calculated by using the midpoint method. The numerator of every one of these things is going to be percent change in quantity and then the name of it tells you what's in the denominator. 
in the, in the price elasticity of demand, it's the price of the good in the denominator, what you're dividing by. With cross-price elasticity of demand, it's the price of a related good. With income elasticity of demand, in the denominator, it's the percent change in income. And then with price elasticity of supply in the denominator is the price. Okay? The numerator is always the percent change in quantity. So once you, hopefully once you get your head wrapped around that, you realize that it, it seems like a lot of information at first, but these things are so consistent between them that it should be easy to understand. And hopefully it's easy for you to, to work through these uh, as you do homework or, or test questions. So that wraps up elasticity. I will see you in a future video.